first of all, a huge thanks to the organisers of uh, this conference to give me the opportunity to talk about the audiological needs of individuals with intellectual disabilities. As is very common in the UK, I'll be using the terms intellectual disabilities and learning disabilities interchangeably here. But just to clarify which population I'm referring to, intellectual disabilities is defined by the World Health Organization as a significantly reduced ability to understand new or complex information and to learn and apply new skills. This results in a reduced ability to cope independently and begins before adulthood with a lasting effect on development. There are many inequalities in healthcare for different groups and the impact to these groups means disparities in both accessing services and the quality of the health care received. Individuals with learning disabilities arguably experience the greatest levels of health inequalities. Average life expectancy is considerably shorter and the quality of life due to levels of health is also poorer. The more profound the learning disability, the more profound these impacts are. Lack of access can be affected by previous poor experiences of health care being a deterrent to seeking help, as can carer knowledge of health needs and indicators that support is required. This latter element is particularly evident in audiological care, as a lack of a response to auditory stimuli can easily be attributed to a learning disability, which is known as diagnostic overshadowing. Inaccurate assumptions are also frequently made about the lifestyles and behaviours of people with learning disabilities, so health promotion activity is often not directed towards people with learning disabilities or presented in a way that is appropriate for that population. According to the National Literary Trust, over 7 million people in the UK alone are described as having very poor literary skills, which inevitably creates a barrier to both healthcare access, but also to management of healthcare conditions. How many hearing aid leaflets are you aware of that are written in an easy read format? There are annual health checks offered to people with learning disabilities, but they are not offered universally and they are not always sufficiently comprehensive in the way that they are carried out to ensure that health issues are acted on. There are various estimates on prevalence of hearing loss in people with learning disabilities that suggest that rates of hearing loss in people with learning disabilities is considerably higher than the wider population. And it's not only particularly high as people get older, but can also present earlier, for example, in the case of individuals with Down syndrome. The impact of this is compounded by the early onset of dementia in this population. Within the 45 to 54 age bracket, for example, over 10 percent of individuals with Down syndrome are reported to be presenting with dementia, which reaches over 35 percent by the age of 65. And it's also thought this is likely to be an underestimate. The impact of hearing loss and learning disability is multiplicative and the impact on social interaction for a group who typically have fewer friendships than the wider population can be critical. The impact of hearing loss on enjoyment of music can also be significant. Music is frequently used by carers for mood regulation, for example, and can have a therapeutic role as well. Considering clinics which offer audiological care for people with a full range of intellectual capacity, at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, approximately 10% of those individuals can complete full audiometry. The majority can complete a modified behavioural assessment with sufficient reliability to plan management, albeit in some cases an incomplete diagnostic test. Around 20% can be assessed using an outpatient electrophysiological assessment and less than 3% require hearing assessment under general anaesthetic. So having stressed the need for audiological care for this population, it is worth considering what is required in terms of improvements to our care. So the following are two small feasibility studies looking at possible areas for future research. It is worth commenting here that recruitment for a study involving people with learning disabilities is challenging, and one of the reasons that research involving this population is so limited. Due to people's experience of health services, there is often a great deal of caution and concern about involvement in research from this population. There are actions, however, such as engagement with the community prior to a study and co-production in study planning that can support the process. 
When we consider the skills required to complete a behavioural hearing assessment, the ability to wait is critical. There are multiple drivers to the ability to wait, and there is evidence to suggest that this skill may be different in people with learning disabilities. There are a number of tests that have been used in the literature to assess a person's ability to wait. One of these tests has been found that for some individuals with Down syndrome, the time they are able to wait may be as short as one second. The British Society of Audiology Audiometry recommended procedure states, the interval between the tones shall be varied between one second and at least three seconds. So if a person can only wait for one second, this will not be sufficient to complete an accurate hearing assessment. Waiting can be supported by training, but to the best of our knowledge, this type of training on the accuracy of a hearing assessment for individuals with Down syndrome has not yet been evaluated. As an alternative to standard audiometry that needs a person to wait, forced choice audiometry is an approach that instead presents a series of moments in time during which a sound may or may not be present and the person being tested is forced to select either yes or no. The study discussed here looked at the feasibility of using this type of approach in adults with Down syndrome. It is important to stress here that the use of the term forced choice would not be appropriate when being applied to use in adults with learning disabilities, given some of the social history affecting this population. So for the purposes of this study, the technique was referred to as two choice audiometry instead. The approach used in this study was derived from a study by Wendy Lucluis and Ray Medis. This is a description graphic from that paper. The sounds were presented at a range of stimulus intensities, the level of which was determined by the preceding response in a paradigm similar to Becachet audiometry. When the response was no, the intensity would increase, and when yes, the intensity would decrease. The sound was then increased and decreased repeatedly so that an estimate of the threshold accuracy could be calculated. There were notable differences in this study, the first being step size. The intensity step size in the Luc Louise and Metis paper was 2 dB. In the current study, there were two conditions for this test, one with 2 dB step size and another with a 4 dB step size. Another difference was that instead of the sounds being presented in computer generated intervals, the sounds were presented manually with timed intervals and the person being tested was prompted to answer the question so that focus in participants with Down syndrome could be maintained. A standard pure tone audiogram was also carried out. The tests were presented in a pseudo randomized order. It has long been suggested that people with Down syndrome are more successful in understanding visual rather than auditory information. So this visual aid was used to support a person selecting whether a sound had been heard or not. This was partly to aid understanding, but also to attempt to reduce possible acquiescence. Where yes and no are presented as equal options, this reduce automatic tendency to say yes. It was noted that one of the participants chose not to answer yes or no or point to the image, but instead pointed to the ear in which the sound was present and in the opposite ear when it wasn't. For all of the three test conditions, the thresholds measured were within the expected 5 dB test retest level expected for audiometry. There were some affirmative responses to no stimulus trials which were particularly notable for the condition which involved 2 dB steps, possibly because more time was spent within an area of uncertainty. The outcomes suggested that there is potential in the use of this approach to assess hearing in people with learning disabilities, but would benefit from a much larger sample and a modified study protocol. In addition to threshold evaluation, Questions remain about other aspects of auditory processing in individuals with intellectual disabilities. Auditory temporal processing is the perception of the temporal characteristics of a sound. A way that it is frequently assessed is gap detection. How long does a period of silence within a sound have to be before it is consciously heard? It has been suggested that the expressive language of a person with Down syndrome is sometimes not aligned to their cognitive capacity and that there are other factors which impact a person with Down syndrome's linguistic skills. 
There are, of course, possible auditory reasons for this, but there's little research in this area. A group of seven adults with Down syndrome and a control group were tested using a gap detection paradigm with easy read support to assist in reporting the presence or absence of a gap. The identification of a negative is more difficult to describe and understand, so for some participants they found it more straightforward to count the number of sounds, one or two. While the group size was too small to definitively draw conclusions about the temporal processing skills of adults with Down syndrome, the test itself was found to be an effective method to measure this ability in adults with Down syndrome with modifications in place. Health Education England's South Region Intellectual Disabilities Programme funded a project to identify workforce challenges faced by the audiology workforce in the identification of potential hearing loss for people with learning disabilities and autistic people across the lifespan. This was explored using a combination of semi-structured interviews and focus groups with people with learning disabilities, their carers, autistic people and audiology professionals to inquire about their experience with audiology services. A freedom of information request was also sent to sites across the UK asking about services available to people with learning disabilities and autistic people from which we had 134 responses. Since 2009 the annual health check has been offered at GP surgeries for some groups with higher health risks including individuals with learning disabilities over the age of 14. While uptake is increasing and it has been shown to contribute to improved life expectancy, only 21% of audiology departments reported receiving referrals from the annual health check. It has been found that many annual health checks are not completed and the sections that are not completed frequently include hearing. The hearing section would also benefit from development as it currently uses otoscopy and largely self-report to prompt a referral to audiology services. And self-report is known to be an inadequate method for flagging hearing loss, particularly in individuals with communication difficulties. Multiple themes were identified as barriers to audiological care. I'm highlighting some of these. While the freedom of information feedback suggested that appointment flexibility was generally high, Participants highlighted challenges with traveling considerable distances to accessing specialist services and complex and unclear patient pathways. One of the challenges that professionals highlighted was identifying the needs that people had before they arrived to facilitate the required reasonable adjustments. Flagging of people with learning disabilities on hospital systems is not universal, and this is particularly low for autistic people although that is partly due to choice. While referral letters were being used as a way to identify patient requirements, the more effective pre-appointment discussion with the patient and their carers and key workers was not being done routinely. Departments are also doing some work to improve access. Home visits are typically very well received, but it is difficult to offer the same quality of care in terms of test rigor, infection control and privacy. Around 60% of departments currently offer this to patients with learning disabilities. Interviews suggest that a quiet waiting area is particularly important to patients, but this is also difficult to offer. Not all services report offering the option of sound field behavioural testing and returning to our figures about the need for electrophysiology for effective testing in around 20% of patients who attend a service for adults with learning disabilities it was a concern that only three quarters of services reported being able to offer this. While there have been some attempts to improve access through easy read appointment letters, this only applies to patient information in 62% of departments. What has been found to be particularly effective in aiding understanding about a service is video information. Only 16% of departments currently offer this but this is likely to become easier over time and there is more to drive to do this as the accessible information standard is more effectively used. One aspect of our service that was well received by many, but not all, are the soundproof rooms. Here is some of the feedback on this. 
There were anxieties created by the enclosed environment for some people, but the level of quiet was really appreciated by others. Please do get in touch if you would like any further information on this topic or ideas for future work in this area.